Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to this really exciting conference. It's really a great pleasure to be here. It's an extremely great honor to be here, and it is also a challenge to present in front of you who are the experts in this field, and um, nobody knows it better than you what it means to be... Uh, also, okay. Uh, to be um, exposed to um, all these different problems uh, which you get on the telephone. But uh, maybe you have mercy with me when I invite you to a place like this one, where your desire and long longings become true, where you can spend your time with your partner, with your love. Uh, but imagine also what would be if you would be alone if you would be exiled from the human society, being forced to live alone without no, no one to talk to on a deserted island with no future. So it is not so complicated to exactly define what it is loneliness. But nevertheless, let me ask, is it a fact, a feeling, a thought? What exactly is it? Um, there are many synonymous expressions which are all in the range of expressing something, some aspects of loneliness like living alone, social isolation, solitude, social network, low social network, low social support, social pain, privacy, desolation, desertion, being left behind. But um, a more um, simple definition of what we understand under loneliness would be to say that is a subjective feeling, that is a discrepancy between a person's preferred and actual level of social contact, a purely subjective stage of lacking desired affection and closeness to a significant or intimate other. Something like emotional loneliness could also be a relational loneliness. But be careful, living alone is not necessarily indicative of loneliness. And social isolation would be something like the objective stage of having minimal social contact with other individuals. And solitude enforces something which is voluntary, voluntary distancing. The prevalence figures I have plotted out here should be taken with some caution, but nevertheless they really show uh, a remarkable homogeneous trend over the whole world from the European, uh, from European nations in the eastern part over China, the US and um, more southern European countries which show that however the level, whatever the level of um, prevalence is, it is really dramatically increasing in old age. And um, you should also take into consideration that the clinical picture of loneliness changes with um, increasing age. Um, if we just take the loneliness of, of younger people, which um, it, is, it is not right to consider um, loneliness in young age as less hurting, as less damaging. Uh, the truth is that... Um, Solitude or loneliness in young age may have a future, may be something which, which after you, uh, afterwards you gain a new life. But it is hurting as it is hurting in old age. And here's a song really nicely presents it. Why does the sun go on shining? Why does the sea rush to shore? Don't they know that the end of the world ended when my love and uh, ended as a course they don't because you don't love me anymore you know. um, in midlife there is a some somewhat different picture of, of loneliness it is something which you already heard this morning as something like an inner neglect it may be caused by some sort of um, social context uh, factors like um, work stress where people start to um, employ self-damaging behavior patterns like compensatory overeating, physical inactivity, smoking, and self-sedation with alcohol drinks, work hard, drink hard. And on the long run, this leads to something 
uh, which is reflecting the own self in a way that adverse synergistics through accumulation of psychological factors come into play. Uh, something like a radical withdrawal, an isolation and also an alienation from, from, from the one's self itself. And this is definitely um, associated with marital stress and uh, so on. And in the end, the resilience, the uh, ability to cope with stress will be compromised. And loneliness in old age, as we, as we have seen before, the most prevalent um, concept of loneliness or the, is associated with loss of generation friends, loss of a meaningful ro role of active participation, loss of identity and values, changes within the family system, also, of course, economic burden, but also the body will not um, do what he should do, multimorbidity, decline in functioning, reduced reserves, cognitive and sensory impairments, sarcopenia, frailty, and last not least, least uh, an increasing confrontation with their own, with own dying. So this is something which really is um, associated with loneliness. And we have shown in, a, in, a, in an earlier study that it is really much hurting. How much does it hurt to be lonely? And the answer is, it is very much hurting, even if you're an old person. But um, we also should um, acknowledge that loneliness can invade the life of everyone, of normal people. But yet there are some exceptions from the rule. Of course, there are people, and you may have uh, experience with them on the phone, which, um, uh, which are really uh, enjoying, in a way, uh, their solitude, which um, are self-sufficient, which are some sort of um, shih tzu eat characters, and um, maybe only in some certain constant in some certain uh, circumstances, they start to uh, uh, experience some break in, in, this, in, their, in their lifeline. And then they, they need help as well. But um, splendid isolation is a major feeling in these people over a long time of period of, of their life. Um, this is something which I think is really important to consider the proximity of physical and social pain. We know that the, we know of the importance of social bonds from, for the mankind. This starts in early life. Mammalian infants are completely dependent on caregivers, relying on them exclusive, exclusively, exclusively for nourishment, care and protection. And in an adult life, being connected to a social group guarantees survival through shared food acquisition, predator protection and care of offsprings. This has been in the last, in the long time ago, but in a way it is also today. And owing on this profound reliance on others, threats to social connection may just be as detrimental to survival as threats to basic physical safety. And our biology has taken, um, has put that into consideration. Um, we know that there is one very famous part in the very high part of, the, of our uh, central nervous system, and that is the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, where the affective component of physical, physical pain is processed. And if you have a damage in this area, you can localize your somatic pain, but the, the pain does not no longer bother you. It is something like a reduction in, in effective pain response. And in animal models, um, if this area is stimulated, these animals will exhibit some sorts of distress vocalizations which are um, typical for affective pain responses, like isolation calls. You know them from little animals, birds, like beep, 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 beep. These are the isolation calls. 
lesions in the, um, in the cingulate cortex leads to a reduction in distress signals. These animals are no longer interested in the proximity with other animals. And in humans, very similar, reduced concerns about jo uh, social judgments of others. So this is a very interesting point. That means that um, the processing of physical and social pain is in the same brain area. And it leads to the same consequences. To make it clear, social pain is pain like physical pain. And, um, and this um, slide shows an experiment recently done and shows the, the MRI um, picture showing where, that the DACC has been um, provoked. And the more this system in the very upper part of the brain is evoked, the more we see in the periphery, far away from that, that uh, inflammation arises. I will come to that in a later part. So the question is, is um, the partnership, is marriage uh, the answer to all misery, or is it just a fairy tale? No, it is not. Um, this is an interesting uh, experiment, and uh, the test person, a test person was exposed to a stimulus, to a noxious stimulus terminal on the skin, and in the same time, the person holds the hand of someone other. First, it was a partner, and others were a stranger, and the third was a ball, and these partners and strangers were separated from the test person by a curtain. And nevertheless, the pain rating was positive. And even when they did a second experiment, when they showed photographs of the loved one and from a stranger and from a neutral object, being exposed to a partner's photograph reduced significantly experimentally induced pain. So this is a cure. And um, besides the attachment, besides the psychological concept, there are also some more uh, simple arguments behind the stress buffering effect of marriage. Reasons may be unmarried people are subject to experiencing multiple sources of stress. Unmarried people may experience stigma and discrimination based on their non-normative status. Unmarried people may less encounter regular routines, less positive health practices, and may therefore be more likely to employ risky behavior. All the fathers here in the room know from their uh, daughters or from their sons, a dad, Please do not eat um, so much steaks, and please do not take the, um, the airplane, take the uh, train, and so on, so on, so on. So they are under social control. And mar unmarried people may generally experience more threats to their, uh, to their social self, shame and loss. And so it is not coming to a surprise uh, what this old Englishman has found. This was a... Uh, this was, by the way, the first epidemiological study, the very first broken heart study in the world, in, published in the British Medical Journal in, in 1969. And it was based on an, exp on, on an observation which this Sir Charles Murray Parkers, who used to spend his holidays on uh, churchyards in Middle England, and um, by chance found out when uh, experiencing and evaluating the stomped thumb stones, he found that um, he, when, when he looked at the death of couples, they were very much in a proximity. And um, so he analyzed the data of the national mortality data and found out that indeed this was right, but it was only right for men. So men, if they died, if, if their woman died earlier, the men um, a short time later followed, but it was not the other way around. Um, uh, you get more information later. Um, so it is also not a surprise to say that a stress marker uh, which was uh, analyzed by, in this recent paper, showed that being married was associated with less uh, stress cortisol. 
And it is very interesting to see um, here that even if married people, they are here, perceived high levels of stress, they continued to have lower cortisol levels. That means even if they experience high levels of stress, their cortisol was buffered down. In contrast to people who were never married and to people, um, nah, and to people who were current, we were previously married. Also these are the most, um, the, the victims which have the, the, the worst outcome. Um, however, Brian Chen and, and, and colleagues didn't look for the marital quality. They said because uh, most married people are relatively satisfied with their marriage, uh, you may believe it or not, um, but we didn't, and we looked in a sample of 500 married older people, how many of these, nevertheless, they were married, claimed to say that they were also lonely. This is something which is really um, also reflecting a proxy of the, of, the, uh, of the marital quality. And we found a number of 15% who were lonely. And um, looking into their cortisol patterns, we um, were able to show for men that those who were lonely had an impaired cortisol pattern, meaning that um, the biology has a trace in their body because of their um, impaired marriage quality. Um, there are more studies dealing with this, uh, with this issue. Uh, this study was uh, a big study from the US shows that concerning coronary heart disease, there is no difference between married and non-married men and women. Concerning total mortality, men have an advantage to be married, women not. And women have a specific, particularly heightened risk if they, um, if they um, experience a conflict um, response pattern which the authors called um, silencing. So women who self-silenced during conflict with their spouse compared to women who did not had a four time higher risk to die. And uh, so it does not come to a surprise that Christina Otkomer in Sweden in her um, fem uh, Stockholm female coronary risk study showed that the uh, marital stress was even to more toxic than the work stress. Social relationship very close to uh, what we see in with this partnership, but it is more general and it has been uh, subject to many studies, especially in social science. And um, papers have shown that people who are highly isolated have a, if they are in men and in women, have a substantially reduced risk to survive. We'll keep that out. Um, and um, it, this has also been shown recently for clinical, in clinical studies. This is a very important study dealing with patients with heart failure, one of the most um, dangerous uh, disease conditions in cardiology, published in 2018. And they show that people who are um, lonely or socially isolated have a higher risk, a substantially higher risk uh, of death, substantially higher risk of hospitalization, of emergency visits, and of outpatient visits. So it is very clear that being socially isolated while suffering from heart failure is a additional risk for, for these people. And the same is true for the coronary artery disease. As you can see here, um, these data show that um, it is a substantially increased risk for women, but not for men. And the 
women who are lonely, this, these are so-called Kaplan-Meier survival curves, and the lower the curve, the more um, patients have died. As you can see here, they, from the beginning on, they had less chance to survive if they were lonely, and this is um, very bad. And recently, um, the research has also uh, gone to uh, the type 2 diabetes mellitus. We show, have shown that, this, um, that living alone is a risk factor for men, that poor structural social support is a risk factor for men, especially if they are in a low educational stratum. Also this is, a, is a, an additional point to consider that men being low educated have a substantially increased risk to, um, to, to become um, diabetic. Um, why is this the case? Um, it could be that um, the being socially connected leads to a contagion in a way by promoting healthy lifestyle factors, by increasing physical activity, by increasing happiness and so on. But it could also be the opposite. It could also be that social contagion could amplify unhealthy lifestyles. And um, in this study, we analyzed this point where specifically interested in socially obese patients and uh, compared them to socially non-obese patients and surprisingly found that socially obese patients were less depressed than socially connected ones. And socially connected obese patients had more somatic symptoms and more sleep complaints and their life satisfaction decreased with increasing body mass index, however, only in socially connected participants. Here you can see normal weight, overweight, and obese, and um, the, uh, the prevalence of uh, life satisfaction significantly decreases while the life satisfaction in obese is on a low level but stays there. It has no influence. So after a mean period of 14 years, also we followed them for 15, 14 years and we identified um, 900 or so almost 1,000 cases of incident type 2 diabetes. Socially isolated participants had higher risk. This was expected after what we ha I've, I've shown before. Obesity was also a, a high risk factor, but the combination of social isolation and obesity it, interestingly enough, did not increase the risk, but in a way dampened it. So sometimes you get um, uh, uh, findings as a scientist which are somewhat um, beyond your expect expectation and maybe even not political correct. Psychobiological pathways. I have mentioned uh, some of these by, uh, already, but I should really outline, and this is really important, that everything what we learn about acute stress uh, may not, may be something which is very normal for us. This just, uh, this Dutch uh, scientist said, being worried for a while, being scared, feeling angry or disappointed cause reactions in the body, of course, like heart rate, blood pressure increase, peak in cortisol, and catecholamine release, inflammation, and so on. But this is a completely natural and healthy bodily reaction. So the acute answer of the, of the body on stress reactions is not harmful. It becomes harmful if we are dealing with prolonged stress responses. Our body is prepared for running away from a predator um, if a lion comes along, we uh, try to get uh, a safe place. But we are, uh, our biology is not prepared for sitting at a computer and being angry the whole time when reading your emails and so on. So negative rumination and worrying is, is what is really toxic. And comparing that with what we discussed today with loneliness, Loneliness is a, also, is a best 
chance to, to get into such a negative rumination and worrying situation. We have the ability to create representations of events in the past, memories. We also have representations of events that, which might happen in the future, which might never happen, but this may worry us even more. This is not good for your body, but on the other hand, it's a purely human reaction. It has an enormous evolutionary advantage for us. We are better able to learn from the past and make plans for the future. And this may be what this famous um, um, uh, researchers dealing with social isolation have um, s formulated. Evidence indicates that loneliness heightens sensitivity to social threats. They underline the biological advantage and motivates the renewal of a social connections. But it can also impair executive functioning, sleep, and so on. So he and these researchers really highlight the both sides of the coin. It may be positive and it may be bad in the same way. And coming more concrete to the, to the question, what is the crosstalk between the body and the soul. We have three major um, pathways, so to say. And um, I only want, I do not go into detail, but I only want to mention it very shortly. And that the first system is the autonomic system. It leads in under chronic stress conditions to accelerated heart rate, to reduced heart rate variability, to sympathetic overregulation, parasympathetic withdrawal, disbalance between sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation, and may also lead to a blunted reaction. And, um, and we are also in psychocardiology more and more getting um, into the field of understanding that the parasympathetic nervous system has an enormous role in um, healing uh, our patients. Um, much more evidence in loneliness research is the endocrine system. I have already mentioned the cortisol dysregulation, the HPA act activation, stress hormones, and overexpression of pleiotropic hormones. I shortly say some words to that. Um, don't worry, I will not go into detail, but only want to, sh to say um, to those of us who are not so familiar with the stress biology, stress is produced in the upper, in the upper brain regions, among others in the, um, um, in, in the regions which I already mentioned, and later is processed in the hypothalamus, which is the middle of the brain, and that, that is the neuroendocrine interface in our brain, and from there, all the information goes down to the adrenal cortex in the kidney. And from the kidney, all the hormones are excreted and produced. And the, and the takeaway message at this, at this point is to say, for example, cortisol has the ability to, um, to stimulate very many stress-related functions in the body, but in the same time, it dampens down its own secretion in the brain. And that is a positive feedback uh, condition. And this feedback condition is not available in stress disease uh, patients. Here, this uh, blunting of the, of the own um, hyperreaction does not work anymore. This is a, an, an argument for the, um, the aldosterone system. I only want to mention that for psychologists and psychosomatic researchers, the glucocorticoids, the cortisol is a major topic, but we uh, also go into the mineralocorticoids and show that uh, the combination of living alone and depressed has an enormous impact on, the, on an increased level. And the same is true for serum uh, leptin levels. Um, and the last 
um, hormone I would like to mention. It's just in, in research, uh, in, in, in work progress in our lab is oxytocin. You may have um, heard about that as a love hormone, but the reality is that it is not only a love hormone. It deals for many different types of functions. Among others, it has a function in the metabolic regulation. And um, so we argue that oxytocin may buffer the negative impact of psycho psychosocial stress and mediate the benefit benefits of social interactions, but unfortunately neither loneliness nor obesity was found to affect oxytocin levels. There was a trend in women, but it was not significant. However, and this is our very recent finding from last week, when we um, put them together, oxytocin, in a group of lonely and obese women, then we found a significant lower level of oxytocin in this in this population, which is, um, which is shown here. Not lonely and obese, women, lonely and obese, a really high significant lower level, and low levels of oxytocin is bad for your metabolic functioning. And one word to the immune system. This has been a revolution in stress research over the last uh, 15 years. We know now that the immune system itself has a regulatory function in, um, in the stress um, system. And only as a takeaway message, I would like to say that um, what that means. It means that the immune, Im, immune reactions are not on, the body reacts not only in an antigen defending of objective toxic material like viruses, bacteria, so also everything which gets into the body, but for the body it is doesn't matter if it is objective or subjective because the body also reacts on subjective stress in that it increases pro-inflammatory cytokines and dampens down anti-inflammatory cytokines. And this is a answer to the question, is subjective something which we could ignore? We could ignore it, but our body would not. So coming to an end, failure to respond, also we are dealing in general with in, in stress responses on chronic conditions like loneliness in failure to respond appropriate on usual counter regularity feedback mechanisms. We lack negative feedback. We have um, individual distress-related vulnerability thresholds, and we have prolong prolonged involuntary processing of emotional information. Okay, I stop at this point and um, we'll give no summary but instead, I will give you a question. Is somebody here in the audience who knows this person? What is his name? Ötzi, what the German would say, and in English it would say the Iceman. Well, the Iceman was found on a high um, glacier in the borderline between Italy and Austria, so I took him with me today. And um, yeah, he was a non-smoker. He had a high level of physical fitness. He had a favorable body mass index, no visceral fat. He was eating healthy organic food and um, no particular matter pollution by cars and by industry. Nevertheless, researchers in Bozen have found out that he was suffering from generalized atherosclerosis. And how was that? And um, if the objective somatic reasons are not um, uh, employing this, the, the uh, casual explanation, maybe it was that he was lonely. He had no social network, no one to talk to. He was alone when he died. He was anxious. He had often fear of death. He had multiple trauma, he was in a sustained readiness for fight and flight reactions and had a pessimistic outlook, completely right, 
and loss of Philip uh, vitality. And in the end, he had something, he didn't have something which he should have had. He should have had a telephone to phone you. Thank you very much for your attention.